Now, the thing that about the gold line is, is that when we opened up the registration from the gold line, the meeting almost sold out like three weeks ago. Amazingly enough, Habib is popular. He's a hot ticket. And the result that you all need to get out a lot more. <laughs> you know what? We got we got it, we got pens, we got newsletters, and I could give the whole bylaw on Habib, but he can give it and that way um, we can start. So Habib. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the presentation tonight. I heard all of your introductions and then it confirmed what I was suspecting. You're all a bunch of transit geeks, so you're going to like this, like the presentation. Uh, by way of bio, uh, I've known Bart a long time. I've been in transit for uh, over 20 years. I started after uh, uh, graduating from USC, uh, working for the Board of Supervisors uh, for seven years, and then eventually coming over to the Metro for two years worked for Julian Burke. I was the chief of staff for Julian when he came over, when Dick Reardon brought him over to make some changes at Metro and get them out of a difficult time that they were in. It was during that, that period of time that I was here two years uh, that the excuse me, legislature came in and created the Construction Authority and I uh, eventually took a job at the Construction Authority. I've been there for uh, almost 13 years now. So uh, very pleased uh, with the project um, from Pasadena. So it was a natural to, uh, to go to that project and try to make it work. Um, as I mentioned, we're a separate special purpose entity created by the legislature uh, back in, it went into effect in 1999. It was created the year before. Uh, parenthetically, uh, just so you know that it was updated, our enabling legislation that extended our reach from, uh, from Los Angeles to the county line to beyond the county line to connect us to uh, the city of Montclair. So currently our, our program looks not only to the county line to Claremont, but extending it uh, past the county line a, a mile or so into, uh, into San Bernardino to Montclair Transit Center. Uh, we have all of the responsibilities available to us uh, that Metro had with this project. This was carved out of Metro, the rights and responsibilities to build the project, use design build, acquire right of way, issue debt, all of the things that Metro could do for the, all of the Metro system we were given by the legislature to do for this project. Uh, and it worked very, very well uh, for the initial phase of the project and uh, we're going to uh, the same construct from the legislature for phase two. We have our own separate board of directors uh, represented from the cities that you see there. So we, we try to build a, a board uh, that there's consensus that you actually have reps from throughout the alignment on the board of directors. Uh, not necessarily one city, one vote, which would make a very large board but something that was a little smaller, a little more manageable, but met all of the interests of uh, all of the corridor cities. And, and so far, we believe we've been successful with that. Uh, and that's really what it's all about, is building consensus. We have a joint powers authority, separate from the construction authority, and the joint powers authority is made up of all the elected officials from throughout the corridor. So it's 13 members, as well as a technical advisory committee, also city managers or someone in the public works department, uh, that attends a monthly meeting with uh, the authority offices where I you know, present what is going on with the authority, what is going on with the progress of the project, uh, wherever we are in the continuum, and get the information out, get questions answered, and really try to always build on a consistent message uh, so that there is consensus, because that's really the key, is getting all of these entities behind the project and uh, pointed in the same direction, and that's uh, where I think we've been able to be very nimble in a, and enabled us to get the project going and uh, under construction to the extent that we are. Uh, we have a strategic partnership with Metro. We, do, we build the project for Metro, they ultimately inherit it. They operate it long term. So our job is to build it for Metro uh, in the most efficient way possible so that they can operate it efficiently and safely into the future for many decades in the future. So we have a regular relationship, uh, meetings with Metro where we actually look at their design criteria and we build to their design criteria and we try not to make any cuts or corners. If we need waivers, we have to go to Metro, but because Metro wants the system consistent for their long-term efficient operation. And uh, that's all memorialized in the Master Cooperative Agreement, which is a document we gave them, uh, that sets out the formal relationship between the Construction Authority and Metro. And then we also have another set of documents, Master Cooperative Agreements, with all the cities and stakeholders, major stakeholder cities along the corridor, which sets out our roles and responsibilities in working with each of the cities. And this just gives everybody an idea of what to expect, and there's no surprises, but in the kind of construction that we do, uh, which I'll talk about design-build, uh, it's very important that folks respond to the schedule 
uh, and live up to the commitments of that schedule to keep the project going because that's how this project gets done is by not slowing it down. Uh, other agencies you know, that are bigger have problems moving things through their board and getting decisions made. Uh, we, don't, we try not to have that problem by getting everyone to buy into these agreements so that we can build a new design build and get the project done quickly. Um, you're all familiar with the long range plan. Uh, these were uh, projects that were all included in the Measure R. We were a, a recipient of Measure R. Uh, our responsibility, however, uh, only deals in the San Gabriel Valley, the eastern part of, of, of the county, uh, along the federal <coughs> corridor uh, that all of you know. Uh, the project is, uh, like I said, is, is funded only through Azusa. Uh, there's some re residual dollars that we'll be able to use for the next phase, but uh, fundamentally the project is funded uh, through uh, uh, the uh, Measure R. Um, most of you know that uh, the first phase of Los Angeles to Pasadena opened in 2003, 13.7 miles long, it goes through three cities, 13 stations. Uh, I'm sure everyone here has been on the line right before, and a very successful uh, ridership is up. Uh, you know, the Sierra Madre Bell parking structure is always full, very difficult to, to get in there after 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, very pleased with the ridership overall and its performance. Uh, the next phase of the project is under construction now. It's completely funded by Measure R. Uh, it's 11 and a half miles, five cities, six stations. There's two in the city of Azusa. Our construction will be completed in the summer of 15. Uh, and then ultimately we turn it over to Metro for testing and then they will open it when they see fit. And that part, the opening, is Metro's responsibility. So we don't forecast the opening of the line, we only forecast our end of construction, which is September of 2015. And then Azusa to Montclair is the next proposal uh, segment. Uh, that was just environmentally cleared uh, a couple weeks ago. And then ultimately on to Ontario Airport, uh, which would be another eight miles. Uh, and that, that obviously is not funded as well. Uh, consensus, I mentioned it before, it's, it's really the most important thing from the, the federal officials on down. Uh, we have uh, complete support for this project. Uh, you see here our representatives, all of them support the project, and, and we really uh, tried to work with them uh, to make sure they get the word out of how important this project is uh, to each of their cities that they represent. It's crucial to the development of all these cities. Uh, that this project gets built. And all of them are looking forward to that with redevelopment agencies going out of business. They're really look, looking to now get developers interested in their cities by virtue of the transit that's now available to them. Uh, the project that we're working on now, as I mentioned, is funded through Measure R. Uh, construction will be done in the fall of 15. Uh, it's being built with three design build packages. Uh, if Metro, when Metro was building this project back in the, in the, uh, in the 90s, uh, they expected to build this project with 40 contracts. Uh, they would have a, a separate contract for each discipline. We chose to consolidate and have three design build packages. The first is the, uh, the bridge over the uh, 210 freeway, which is completed, uh, $18.5 million by Skanska USA. Uh, the second one is the contract with Hewitt Parsons Joint Venture for $486 million, and that's the rest of the project, the alignment itself, all of the systems that go along with it, and then finally our parking facilities contract, which we just awarded uh, a couple weeks ago for $48 million, and that will build all of the parking associated with the 11.5 uh, the mile alignment project. Uh, to keep this project going, we set a very aggressive uh, set of milestones, uh, all that had to happen in a sequence on a schedule for this project to stay on the schedule, the aggressive schedule that we laid out. So each one of these, I don't have to walk through all of them, but if, we, none of the, if all of these didn't come together, this project would not be able to happen. So it took an effort of our consultant, uh, our own staff, uh, as well as our consultant staff to work together, work with all the agencies, pull all the pieces of this complicated project together uh, in an orderly way that fit within our schedule and uh, I'm very pleased that it's all happened the way that it has uh, from the construction related items, uh, with certifying the EIR itself, getting the contracts put together, the procurements done, awarding those contracts without any challenges, as well as those logistics of, of actually doing the physical work uh, and getting things done and negotiated between ourselves and all the third party agencies. All that has fallen together uh, quite nicely over the last uh, couple of years and allowed us to be on schedule for a completion in September of 15. Uh, this is design build package number one, is the Gold Line Bridge. Everybody have seen it? Yep. Yes. Yep. Uh, yep. Beautiful. Yes. I like it, good, good. Yep. Um, 
wanted to do something different and unique uh, to really set this apart from all the other projects. Uh, and had this idea of making it part of the art program. Uh, did a nationwide search. Uh, came together with uh, an artist, uh, Andrew Leister, who uh, came up with this design. Uh, made it very functional and, and something that uh, is a gateway to the San Diego Valley. So we're, we're real pleased. <coughs> Uh, great time, uh, great on-time delivery with, uh, with Skanska, 100% safety record, 95,000 work hours on this project. Inherent in a project of this size is the local content, uh, it's, it's domestic content, but actually the local content within Irwindale, within the actual area of the project. Uh, had a, all of the, the, the concrete coming in, uh, rebar being fabricated in the area. Uh, lots was coming in from the, the San Diego Valley itself, so we were we were really pleased that the local resources could be used for the project uh, to get it built uh, at, at a in very cost-effective way. Uh, we turned this project, uh, this part of the the project, over to the Design Build Two team at Kiewit Parsons in December. Uh, this is another glamour shot of our the project. Uh, our second contract is DB2, which is the alignment, which is all the other elements associated with the project, all the construction uh, aspects of it related to the stations, all of the design. Uh, this is just an update that uh, most of the design packages are completed and approved for construction. The bathrooms that we have remaining will be done over the next couple of weeks. Uh, there's been clearing and grubbing and grading throughout the alignment. Uh, there's station construction, actual platform construction underway in three of the cities right now. Uh, the bridge is underway. Uh, a big part of this, and I'll talk about it in a second, is the, all of the bridges that are part of this. There's a total of 24 bridges that are part of this project, uh, and some of those are already underway, as well as improvements at the crossings uh, in Duarte and Azusa and Monrovia. Uh, and then there's also uh, all that's related to the uh, MO site, which is part of this project, the maintenance operations campus. Uh, is fully under construction right now. I think you'll see some slides of that too. Uh, just the design progress uh, to show that we are uh, nearly complete with all, all completed with uh, a proof of construction design for the stations, the maintenance facility, all the systems, and all the track work. Uh, designed by segment, uh, each of the, the segments, uh, there's just a little bit remaining on segment one, the civil work, but the balance of the project, as you can see, has been completed. And this is how we're tracking uh, our schedules by looking at this. I mentioned the uh, bridges that are part of this. All of them have been approved for construction. All of them are uh, a, a, in some form of construction or pre-construction uh, right as we speak. Uh, we have uh, each stations uh, have been fully designed at this point. Uh, you see the renderings there, but all of the art elements that are already employed into this, uh, the station colors, all the landscaping details, all that has already been decided by all the cities through this process that we've had over the last couple of years. So we feel very strongly that we are in, in good shape to keep the project on schedule uh, over the next two years. Uh, I see that those three uh, city stations are under construction and then the, the others will be happening at some point towards the, the beginning of the year. Uh, just a view of the historic station in the Morovia and uh, the construction has taken place both there in uh, Newport and Monrovia. <coughs> Uh, one of the interesting aspects of this project is we are in a shared corridor and we are not on a shared track at any time. There will be three tracks, two for the light rail and one for freight. And uh, there is a shared corridor in a 100 foot railroad right of way uh, from Azul, I'm sorry, from Irwindale East and that's to serve Miller Brewery, which is right there in Irwindale. There is no freight service west of Irwindale, so you see that we had the uh, alignment discontinued right of way uh, to, the, to, the, to the west of Irwindale. Then we had to go through the process now of working with the freight east of Irwindale so that we are a shared corridor. The right of way corridor is about 100 foot wide throughout uh, in most cases. So uh, to have three tracks in there, we have to realign the track. So the current freight track is being moved to the south, and then we're including in our two tracks. So the coordination, obviously, with the active freight uh, is very complicated. Uh, because there is still a requirement of freight service. We didn't want to do anything that got in the way of service to Miller Brewery. So we had to uh, keep that active at all times, and that's going on right now, and uh, the, the, that track will be active for freight by the end of the year. 
Uh, and this also has uh, shared use, like, as I mentioned, all the way through into the next phase of the project, but we're focused right now only on uh, what we call 2A, uh, to the Azusa Glen Road border. Uh, construction activities, you see, uh, I talked about the freight installation and then the right of way, this is uh, the work that's going on there. Uh, pretty much every inch of the 11 and a half miles, you'll see construction at this point. Uh, this is just a list of all the grade crossings that had to go through the approval process. Uh, it's, it's very complicated working with the PUC, but we're, we're very pleased that we're able to get that done. Uh, I think that's one of the key star successes. We worked with the PUC early on. We got those approvals in advance of our construction work. And that's really allowed us to be uh, to schedule more carefully our construction and not have to worry about juggling PUC issues. Uh, some crossings, uh, improvements going on uh, in, uh, in the city of uh, uh, Nairobi and Gordy. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of structures or bridges in this project. There's actually 17 crossings that require 24 structures uh, in total. Uh, sometimes we are taking a structure and removing it. Sometimes we're rebuilding it or we're modifying a structure or we're putting uh, structures next to it if they're in good shape and they're only built to accommodate one set of tracks, we'll build a twin next to it to accommodate uh, a second set of tracks. So uh, there's a combination of those kinds of decisions that were made for the structures by the design builder. Uh, and they're uh, along the alignment. Uh, you can see here um, that these, some of the structures uh, that, are, uh, that, that don't exist, that we're building from new, are uh, listed here. Uh, the first one being the goal line bridge that crosses the freeway, and then uh, from Santa Anita, we're actually building a city paid for underpass, and then there's a tunnel pin we're building one adjacent to the existing bridge, and then at Foothill, Palm, and Citrus, we're building adjacent to the existing bridge. Uh, and then there's structures that need to be modified or retrofit for, uh, for whatever <coughs> reason, and that's going on in these 10 situations here. Again, we're choosing uh, to allow the contractor to make those decisions and work with the, uh, the local agencies that have the criteria that they meet that criteria. And then some station uh, actual structures are being replaced completely. Uh, this is the San Diego River Bridge. Uh, this is one of the largest span bridges that we're going to be building that goes over the San Diego River. Uh, it's uh, obviously very important to our Corps of engineers that this get rebuilt within the season, so we have a seasonal permit, uh, which just went into effect in March, and we have really the dry season that we can actually do work in there and, and not uh, hamper any of the flow of water or any critters that grow in the, in the riverbed. Uh, so it's, it's a consideration. It's, uh, you go by the count of snakes in the riverbed, but if you uh, drive on the 605 and you look toward the city of Hope, you'll be able to see the work going on and now the bridge has actually been removed. And we'll be doing the demo of the foundation, the rebuilding of the foundation uh, this summer. Uh, as I mentioned, the design standards that we use for all of these uh, will really come down to whatever Metro wants, uh, working with Caltrans, <laughs> Army Corps of Engineers, uh, Federal Railroad, and SCRA. These are all the, the stakeholder partners that we have that we have to fill these bridges to. Uh, so it's a lot of coordination, uh, you know, a lot of authority times you can imagine some of the engineering staff and design staff here at the outside organizations know uh, the, the level of detail we have to get into and making sure that we have the buy-in from all the entities. Uh, in a lot of cases, they are being represented by third-party engineering firms uh, that we have to work with as well. Uh, but it's coordination and uh, getting folks to buy into our schedule, which has really helped us out and allowed us to get as far as we have. Uh, 23 of the 24 structures have been approved for construction. Uh, the, the last one at Foothill is, um, is underway, so that, sh that shouldn't be a problem for us as well. Uh, and right now you see these, uh, these that our construction is commenced on these eight structures here. Uh, one of the requirements of this project that, that Metro uh, put upon us was that if we're building this project, your maintenance capacity system-wide had been exceeded and they couldn't add cars to the system without another maintenance facility. So we had, they said, Metro, Gold Line, you have to build a maintenance facility. And we said, okay, great, we'll build it for our eight vehicles that are going to be required this extension. And they said, no, 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 you have to build it for 85 vehicles because their system overall is so burdened. So, uh, you know, it's essentially they had a gun to our head. They said, don't get the money unless you do it. So we did it. 
Uh, they paid for it, uh, which was great. We had to go through finding the site, getting environmentally cleared, dealing with all the things you have to do to get a project uh, that large done in the period of time that we had. Uh, 24 acres, it'll service 85 vehicles. Uh, this is a project unto itself. This is about $190 million of capital goes into this 24-acre campus. Uh, and then there's another $100 million in real estate acquisition that is associated with this project. So um, we're proud we're able to do it uh, for Metro. Uh, we know how difficult it is. They know how difficult it is. And uh, they, I think a, a bit of it was they didn't think we can get it done, but we did get it done. So we, we did it with their help, actually. Uh, the funding, Metro pays 75% of it, the 75% is strictly for other than the goal line. Uh, but then also they support us along the way with some key decisions in a timely way that allowed us to get the project done. So we were pleased with it uh, because it was a, it, this, could have, uh, this could have been a, 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 a killer for the project if we couldn't get this part of it done. Uh, it's just a layout of the facility, uh, a site plan. Uh, this has all of the capabilities that a uh, full maintenance facility needs to have. As I mentioned, metro system was overburdened, and uh, they really were in need of an expansion for their fleet. Everything they're going to be dealing with, anything coming online, the regional connector, all these are going to have an impact to the maintenance facility system wide. Uh, this is the main building uh, at the maintenance facility. If you're on the 210 freeway, actually, at Myrtle, and you look to the south, you can see it, it's completely graded. Some of the pictures here, but uh, there's, there's nothing left on it. So uh, there, are, the construction is underway. It will be up out of the ground this summer. Uh, what you're seeing here on the top right is uh, the uh, blowdown area of the maintenance building. This is where uh, engineers can get down below, mechanics can get down below the vehicles, and uh, be able to service them from beneath. So this is the foundation for the blowdown area here. Uh, as part of it is DB3, we, as I mentioned, we have uh, parking at all the stations. Uh, they were all calculated as part of the environmental process. It's being awarded with one contractor. Uh, Webcor uh, won the competition uh, with the procurement that we started uh, late last year. And we'll be building all the parking spaces. Uh, most of them are uh, multi-story structures, two and three story structures. And then there's two uh, surface parking lots that are planned. Uh, with regard to uh, each of the stations, because we wanted to look ahead and, and do planning the best that we could with all the information that we had, bringing the cities along, building consensus, we were able to obtain $6 million in grants uh, from the federal government that allowed us to actually plan into the project above and beyond what we had budgeted. Uh, specific bus and pedestrian improvements around the stations. And this looked at everything, bus shelters, uh, pedestrian walkways, uh, bike walkers, better sidewalks, crosswalks, uh, better lighting, all the things that we could uh, design into it. This gave us the ability to go to each of the cities along the way uh, with a, a menu of items that we knew that the FTA would reimburse us for, and they got to choose those elements themselves uh, and help customize their station on this uh, with using this federal grant. So I thought it was very helpful. And, it really allowed us to do some, some things that the public is really going to enjoy that usually uh, agencies don't get to do uh, in, in the early stage. We were allowed to do this and do this kind of planning and actually get the funding to actually Im implement some of the plans uh, as part of our overall construction. So it was great we were able to put that into the WebCore contract and it will all be done as part of the station uh, parking that's underway right now. Uh, with regard to outreach, uh, it's, it's very important to keep people informed. Uh, we have a lot of cities that we're working with, a lot of stakeholders, uh, a lot of disruption, as everybody knows, with construction. But we found if you, nobody likes surprises. So the better job we can do informing everybody at every level, uh, the better off we are. And we've really uh, worked very hard over the last couple of years to build the rapport with each of the cities and stakeholders and make them understand what we're doing. So when we got into construction, there were no surprises, and now we're able to update them on a regular basis with everything that's happening on the project, uh, most specifically to any kind of road closures that are going on, detours that are going on in the project. And there's been a lot already. Uh, there'll be many more in the future as construction goes on. Uh, right now, with regard to construction, when you when you go to our homepage, when you get into our website, initially you went to our homepage, now you'll no longer go straight to the homepage, you'll go to this page, which will be the front page of the homepage. 
and it takes you specifically to construction. And this allows you to go uh, directly to your city or where you're concerned about, and you'll understand what detours are taking place based on the coordinate streets that you're, you're interested in. Uh, this is something that's a little new that was innovative that we tried to implement, and our response has been very good. So as we get into construction and more notices are going out there and more people are interested in knowing how long the impact is for, uh, where, the, where the detour is, how you get there, they'll be able to go straight to this page and get the information that they need uh, and have a pretty quick, uh, a pretty quick service to their, answer their questions. <coughs> Uh, this is some of the backup of some of the activity that's taking place within a, a certain area that allows them to see the very latest in all the construction updates. And then with regard to future segments, Azusa Montclair was just certified uh, in March, uh, just a couple weeks ago, that uh, looks at the project from uh, the border of Azusa and Glendora all the way to uh, Montclair. Uh, we now want to start advanced conceptual engineering for that element. Uh, it's very important for these projects to, to keep the engineering going so that uh, when you get to a point where you want to go after federal funds, for instance, uh, or any other funds, that you have a well-defined project. The environmental document isn't sufficient to actually put an estimate to, so you need to do a, a series of advanced conceptual engineering exercises that uh, we have the funding through residual dollars of Measure R, and we'll be able to start that probably about the first of the year. Uh, and then we're going to be working with Metro, trying to identify future funding. Uh, Measure J uh, failed, as everybody knows. Uh, we weren't included in Measure J, and we're hopeful that with the new Measure J, whatever Metro decides to do, uh, that they are inclusive and they, they allow our project into it. Uh, we're probably the most cost-effective project, light rail project that's uh, going to be that's being built in LA County. Uh, our our numbers uh, for construction alone. Uh, for our project is in the 40 50 million dollar range just for construction uh, other projects uh, which are all different so just to be clear it's hard to do an apples to apples comparison but Expo I think currently phase two is in the 250 million dollar range I think we side was in the 200 250 million dollar range again there are certain differences underground more elevated all that detail is very important to comparing but it's fair to say that ours is uh, very cost effective because we're using existing railroad right of way and there's no great separation uh, for the most part. It's, uh, the, it's really using the 100 year old railroad right of way. So we think it's a great deal and probably would do very well at the federal level if we tried to compete uh, for federal funds. Uh, our schedule for Azusa Montclair, uh, we, uh, we did the environmental clearance uh, in the spring of this year. Uh, we'll begin the preliminary engineering and get that work awarded, hopefully, and, and done uh, by sometime in, in early 15, put a financing plan together, uh, and start a procurement, uh, and then get into construction 2016 to 2021 and 2022. Uh, none of the, all of this depends on funding, of course. We can get to, through our advanced conceptual engineering, we're very fortunate that we have the seed money that allows us to get that done. But beyond that, there is no funding, and uh, we're really focused on what, what Metro does with the, the new Measure J, whatever extension they do, the sales tax that we are in there, and hopefully uh, that uh, renders the vote that's required to, to get it approved uh, so, that, so that other projects can be built. Uh, Azusa Montclair Extension, uh, so we have a station in each of the cities. It's about 12 and a half miles. It goes through six cities. Uh, we're in the shared corridor all the way uh, from Pomona East. Uh, we have uh, two significant grade crossings that we're building uh, at Lone and Town Avenues uh, that are part of this project. Uh, but for the most part, as I mentioned, it's at grade and within the existing railroad right of way. Uh, and just closing, all these uh, projects are great, but it really comes down to what it does for local economies. Uh, just in this phase uh, that we're in construction alone, uh, spending is huge, it's $490 million in construction alone, uh, 6,900 jobs overall, about uh, half of that is, is construction alone, uh, and it does wonderful things not only for the local economy but also raising local sales tax revenue. So it's, it's very important for uh, the local agencies uh, and the local cities that we uh, generate these kind of jobs at a time when the construction industry has been decimated. Uh, with regard to our overall spending, uh, it's pretty standard uh, what we're doing. I think probably out of all the projects that are out there, uh, we have the, the, the lowest administrative costs 
uh, and probably service costs and all the projects that are being built. We have a different overhead structure than Metro has. Uh, I always say Metro has to solve world hunger. We only have to build a choo-choo. You know, I mean that's really what it comes down to. We're very, very focused, and we will be very lean. Our staff is all of 14 people, and then we have consultant staff that we bring in and out as needed. But it makes for a very efficient operation uh, that allows us to keep uh, all most of the dollars in the construction area uh, where they belong and improvements where they belong. Uh, ultimately, uh, you know, we see this being a, a long-term project that is going to help Metro, it's going to help all of the cities along the, the alignment. Uh, all of the cities that we've worked with over the last several years uh, have embraced uh, TOD around all of the city stations. Uh, it's they're really turning back to when these cities were formed 100 years ago around the railroad, so they're really coming back to that concept. And they're all looking for putting density around these stations. Uh, you never would have thought these small cities out in the San Gabriel Valley would, would think of three and four story structures uh, and have density around the station and they've all embraced it. And what we've done, what we could to promote it, I think they've looked at phase one of our project, the success in Pasadena, uh, what's happened in Highland Park, what's happening in a lot of other parts of the goal line, uh, really giving them some envy that they can do this too in their old towns and they're all planning for that and uh, I see no reason why. This, uh, this project won't have a very significant economic impact on all of the cities uh, long term. Uh, and, you know, ultimately that's what it's about, where it will take you. Uh, we talk about all these generators. Uh, we're very, very fortunate uh, through all of our studies that we've been able to identify a lot of trip generators and destinations throughout this project. Uh, it's really caught the eye of all the elected officials. We go, we go to Washington. Uh, first thing everybody says, they all know Claremont Colleges, they all know the Ontario Airport and the situation with Ontario Airport and really believe that it's important to connect these rail lines to airports. And uh, we, we, we agree and we just need to make sure that we build this link from uh, Azusa all the way past the county line uh, to Ontario Airport ultimately. And that's the end of my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions that anybody would have about the project. Yes, <coughs> who's building the MNL facility? Say again? Who is building the MNL uh, It's part of our uh, design build contract. Keith uh, Parsons, Transportation Group, is the design build team. Somebody here was working on it? I heard a voice. Well, did you work out who you're working with? Uh, just with the, I'm with the maintenance designer for the equipment consultant. Okay, so you're a sub key with? Yep. Yeah, so Kiwi is part of the overall DB2 package. Uh, okay, uh, you have the authority to build all the way into San Bernardino County and the Ontario Airport, but how much responsibility does the County of San Bernardino have in terms of the building and the funding of that extension? They're 100% responsible for the funding of the extension from the county line to the next station, 100% responsible. Uh, when the operations comes around, <clears throat> they will be 100% responsible reimbursing the Metro for the cost of the incremental cost of operating past the time. Yes, Okay, two part. Part one with the extension to, let's say, to Montclair Convention Ontario Airport. Has there been any sort of any discussion with Metro or operational look at the need for an express track that would actually make it feasible to operate. Because right now this is a 50 mile line from downtown all the way to Ontario Airport. Some way to make it a faster service and tailor it to you know a more you know to to those type of travelers who are trying to get to the airport. That's going to be the main yeah number one. Oh, well, I have no chance for that. Part, part well, first of all, the bigger problem is there's no bathrooms. So you have a 50 mile ride, it can take you 85, 90 minutes from end to end. You've got bigger problems than an expressway, another track. Uh, this is, it's not going to be an express train. I, I don't think we, we, it would be very costly to put that service in. Uh, Metro has done skip stop service before and it didn't work out. Uh, I think it is what it is. Uh, it may sound like a long time if you're going to go to an airport now, but in a few years from now, it's going to be the quickest way to get to the airport. Okay, and that also gets to the next point with uh, some of the stations of the EIR, given the, the ridership, at least compared to other lines, there's the lack of transit connectedness in terms of service. There's very few 
you know, bus terminals or things next to the stations. It, will that be addressed in, you know, this current phase, potentially at the next segment to Montclair? Because I think if you get that, that will help your ridership, which I have actually help you get the federal dollars that you need. <laughs> Uh, we've done bus rail interface analysis and planning into phase 2A, so that's part of our design build for the, the, the parking garages right now. So that's in place. And then it's identifying potential routes, which we're working with Foothill, to make sure that there's that connection between, it's that last mile, and that's what we keep talking about, uh, to make sure those connections are made. So we think we, we've done the best job that we could. Uh, it's never going to have the ridership of the subway, obviously, or Expo. It's just the density is not there. Uh, but, and as far as competing at the federal level, uh, our ridership, you know, from the very light analysis we've done already, based on our ridership and the cost per mile, we think we're a pretty efficient project that would still do well uh, to compete against the, the federal lines. I'm very interested in the connection to Ontario Airport. And I know the San Bernardino County Sandbag and others have been studying that. I think especially with respect to a Metrolink connection. What kind of um, interface is there um, between the Gold Line and, and the Metrolink um, planners and the Ontario Airport connection? Is it possible? Um, or are we talking about a kind of a, um, a common plan that would uh, enable both systems to efficiently access the airport, or can you just update us about sure. the status of that discussion? Well, probably two years ago was when there was serious effort by Ontario to do master planning, and we were involved in that, and so was Central Land. By the airport itself. By the airport itself. They had done that. It's, you know, airport problems have taken it in a different direction right now, and I'm pretty sure they're not doing master planning right now because of the way it's probably more like five years now, two years ago. But they haven't done a lot. But the, the view was always that there would be platforms set up so Metrolink and the Go Line would be pulled into a common area that would be accessible to the airport. And then possibly a people mover from that point into the airport property because the thing is. Yeah, I noticed in one of your slides, do you have uh, the Arcadia station uh, map there? Because it looks like there was something really, really seriously wrong with that location. <laughs> Further back is a big uh, intersection. You're at right there. Right there. See, I noticed uh, we attended, uh, Harold and I, we attended a, a scoping meeting where they had models of these, this particular station. And it shows that the tracks come from an elevated structure way over here somewhere all the way down the grade level to go through that intersection, caddy corner, to stop at that station, only to go right back up to the same level to cross Huntington Boulevard. Now, 10 years after that opens, that's going to be socked in with automotive traffic, and with trains going through there every five minutes, there's going to be a nasty accident, because the growth in that area is going to just overwhelm it. Shouldn't that have been grade separated completely with the station right over the intersection and with the uh, parking structure also located like either in this area or wherever? Yeah, I'm not going to speculate as to redesigning it with you right now, if that's okay. I, I feel confident we've done what we need to do. Uh, we went through the environmental process, we had all the traffic engineering done, we worked with all the cities, so uh, I'm confident that you've done a good job. So we have to live with the decisions we made. And, you know, I think we're in fine shape. Yes, I'm kind of glad we're on this slide because I, I like what you said about getting uh, federal federal money to improve the call it the experience around the area of sort of these amenities. How does that get initiated? Is that something that comes from from the authority or from Metro, or how does that all happen? How does that get started so other people? You know, we went to, we were in Washington looking for project money, and there was a, uh, a grant <coughs> program that allowed these interface improvements uh, that we, our congressman, David Dreyer, at the time, uh, submitted the application for us, and 
we were successful. The cycle prior to that, we were successful in getting, I think, $3 million for planning grant. So this was a natural to go from that planning grant to this, because that's really what the planning was for, is accessibility and pedestrian interface. So once we did that work, now we have an idea of what we needed you know, to improve these stations, and they would call this grant attention to us and took advantage of it. It was great that we could do it as part of this. It was the most efficient way of doing it. It was just ideal timing-wise that we could actually put it in the parking contract, and that was their responsibility, the parking contract, to put these elements in. Yes, sir. From a development standpoint, does it really matter whether a station is at street level or elevated in limiting the opportunities for uh, development around the station? It's much better if it's at grade. I, I think it's got to be part of your community. If you, if, if you want Black Rail to be in a tunnel, then you should have built the subway. You know, this is supposed to be part of what's going on to create that excitement. So people are, you know, it's no picnic leaving an elevated station and going down and crossing and doing all that. It's a burden. It's much easier just to walk across the tracks to get it to the, the platform. That's my opinion. So uh, I think any of the, the good development that we've done on phase one, because I was around for that, really benefited from it being at the ground level. I mean, Del Mar is a classic case. If that were elevated, you wouldn't have seen the development there. So close, the density wouldn't be so close as the park buildings would have been there. So I think there's a lot of examples where you really wanted it ground level, and it's a lot cheaper to build it that way than putting it up, because those elevated stations are not cheap, and they're not that friendly. Uh, just th this may be out of your uh, reach a little bit, but I just wonder if you know anything about what kind of plans the state of California might have in terms of uh, uh, changing the system so you don't have to get an absolute two-thirds vote on any tax measure. Because what did they, what did Measure J lose by a, a quarter of a percent or something? And they got a huge majority anyway. Uh, what's the state going to try to do about this? Well, Carol Lewis, Senator Carol Lewis, carrying legislation that would lower the voting threshold. So there is a plan uh, out there, whether it's successful or not. It's got to be approved by the legislature and it's got to be approved by the voters. So that's it's actually by two thirds, probably. Yeah. Uh, no, I think oh, simple no. majority. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's, there's several bills that are doing the same kind of thing. There are four bills that are saying that. Why don't you come up with Mm -hmm. I'll take a second because the right person is in the room here. It's Denny Zane. Why don't you just tell them a little? So it's a good, it's a valid question. Everybody here wants to support your next move. So why don't you tell them, please? There are four uh, bills pending in the legislature that would propose a constitutional amendment um, that would affect transportation. Two of them are transportation only. Uh, one of them is transportation in cities and counties. And it puts only capital not operating. Um, the fourth is really all of the <coughs> government agencies, essential and special districts, capital and operating. So there's going to be a lot of discussion about what's the right way to go. Is it a 2014? Is it a 2016 measure? You know, you, you don't want to go when, you, when you're not really confident you can win. It takes two thirds of the legislature to put it on the ballot and 50% of the voters to approve it. Um, it is possible that such a measure could include a um, effective immediacy, immediately clause, which would mean that local measures could be on the ballot at the same time, and if the state measure passes, the local measures would have a 55% requirement. Um, that, I think, uh, is ideal, given the urgency of the funding needs of transportation, but education and other other issues have um, are in the queue also. There are measures related to those. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit of a complicated dance in the legislature. Um, the governor will be up in 2014. Will he want a measure on the ballot? Well, we don't know. Depends if he has a rival candidate that really matters, I think. But it's an exciting opportunity and an exciting time. And I think Measure J and the Alameda County measure uh, were so close that it really excited this discussion. And there are really there are four related to transportation, eight overall um, proposed constitutional amendments. But um, or you could do it the old-fashioned way and just get two-thirds, which was possible previously. It didn't happen. It came so close this time that maybe 
folks did a better job. I mean, that's what it comes down to. You know, folks did a better there was, job. There was a, a lower turnout, about ten percent lower turnout for that election than there was for the 08 election. Yeah. That certainly matters. And if we're going to armchair quarterback, there was less of an investment made in public information that was done previously, which I think, I think that's correct. Huge effect on it. When it was that close, and you look at those numbers, and just if just a few more people were talking about it, it could have happened. Well, the one thing that Metro's public um, uh, outreach candidates cannot advocate, the one thing it could have done better than the TV ads did was make it clear that it was not a new tax, right. um, that this was an extension of an existing tax. Um, that's something that. You need sort of a more detailed medium than television commercial can provide. So, yeah, I think the chance prospects of winning two thirds are very real. Um, I mean, if I had to to bet, I would think it'd be easier to get two thirds next time than it would be to lower the threshold. I think um, lowering the threshold is huge. It's a well, huge political push to get that to happen. Well, I, mean, I, I think that's a that's a fair thing to a fair discussion. Um, lowering the threshold creates an opportunity for not just Los Angeles County, but all over the state. And for all future measures, um, you know, Measure R uh, funded a lot, <coughs> but Gold Line included and Crenshaw Line and 405 is the public pass line. There's lots of projects that need more resource to really fulfill their, um, their promise. And we should do them all. And that will probably require not just an extension, but a new, um, an increase in revenue of some sort. And, you know, so we're not only looking at a J, we may be looking at an R plus as well. So, I don't know, 55% would give us more confidence about all of that. Unfortunately, it's the only game in town. There's very little federal dollars now. Uh, I don't know what the prospects are in the future. Even in the heyday of federal dollars, there, there were so few dollars nationwide that were available and back in you know Tom Bradley's day there were so few projects now everybody's building rail so their competition is probably grown ten times and the dollars have not really increased very much so it's tough the federal if, if folks want to get it built I think it's got to be funded locally and LA has done a great job the history look at the map it's, you know most of it's been done with local funding That's right. it's the only reliable way of getting it done and they came so close last time that I have confidence that, you know, my assessment, it'd be easier to do that than, than change the threshold. I think that's really a uphill battle. Still voting. Any other comments, questions? Sure. Yes, sir. Um, has Metrolink, uh, what, the second phase of Metrolink expressed any concern that um, the Montclair extension might undercut some of their writers or service? No, not openly, but uh, they, the, uh, if you're if you're wanting to go downtown, you're going to take Metrolink. Yep. That's just the fact of the matter. They really don't compete. If you want to go to Pasadena or any of the foothill cities, you're going to take or Pomona, you're going to take the Gold Line. You're really not going to take Metrolink. It's much faster to take Metrolink than it's going to be to take the Gold Line. So they, they don't really parallel service. Well, I mean, because I mean, sometimes if I'm on uh, if I'm going to sometimes if I'm going to Pasadena because I live on the San Bernardino one. So if I plan to go Pasadena, I would take the Metro Link down to downtown Link and go up to Gold Line. Yeah. So in that case, if I was, you'll lose those riders. <laughs> but you know that's it's kind of tough. I mean, you want to make the most efficient system possible, and why would you want people to go downtown LA to get yeah, to Pasadena? Yeah, that's also true. They can't have everything. It's a Any other questions? One last good question. Um, several months ago. Uh, Maybe a year ago, uh, somebody was here talking about the um, uh, the uh, downtown connector and so forth, and how that would affect Gold Line, Blue Line, on everything else. <coughs> and from what I understand, Gold Line coming down from Pasadena would be through into the line that goes to uh, Long Beach, whereas uh, the East LA extension would be through into Santa Monica by way of the Expo Line. I don't know if it would be renamed or. Is that currently the way it's planned for through downtown the way it is now? Yeah, I mean, and ultimately I mean, just to add more confusion to what I think you were referring to is that the, if you get on the blue line in Long Beach and you go north, you'll stay on the blue line through the regional connector 
and onto the gold line, we're going to probably rename the gold line to the blue line. Used to be the blue line. It was the yeah. blue line, we changed the gold line, and we changed right. it back to, so people are going to go nuts when they figure that out. <laughs> I think that's, because otherwise the convention of color won't make any difference, make sense to people who don't know the system. I would agree with that. The colors are That's not our job. It's up to Metro. They have the big job of deciding the color. Don't think about A, B, C, and D. Whatever the hell they want to do. Keep us out of it. We watched the purple line discussion. Do folks remember that? Yeah. So we, that's not our thing. We, uh, we try to keep it real simple. And Metro's, you know, they run the system, so they got to decide what's going to be. Yes, sir. Uh, operationally, uh, how difficult will it be to run a line that long from all the way from like Azusa from to like Long Beach? Uh, operationally, the system is built for it. I mean, really, you're talking about electrification, and we'll always have the power, no power surges on a line that that's long. But they're all independent segments with their own tra traction power substations every mile or so. Uh, so operationally, it's really about the operators. It's bathroom breaks and any breaks. It's a very long system. Uh, that's really you know what it's going to come down to. It's a lot of uh, with the line that long. We've got a lot of train sets on the tracks at one time, but uh, you know it can be managed. The system will manage it. it. It will be one of the longest light rail lines in the country that I know of. So how many minutes are you talking about from Union Station all the way to? From Union Station to um, Montclair, Montclair, yeah. it's two hours. seven minutes or something. Two hours, something like that. All for dollar fifty. All for dollar fifty. Two dollars. Yeah. But it's you know you're, that's people are not going to be going downtown necessarily. They're going to be stopping other places. We saw from the analysis that a lot of people are going to pass in. That's a huge uh, a, a generator right now, and probably will be in the future. It really is looking for passing the end of Glendale and Burbank. So who knows what the future of that corridor is, too, because that's where people are going. They're not necessarily going downtown, but if they are, they're going to take Metro. Lake. So why are they connecting? Why are you guys planning to connect to the airport? To Ontario? For the, for the San Gabriel Valley. Because that's going to be the airport. I mean, despite all the, the stuff you're hearing about Ontario right now, Long term, I mean, no one's going to sell the airport and develop it into a park, right? It's going to be an airport for not for us, but for our grandchildren, our great grandchildren. I mean, it's good. It's going to be there for, for, for aviation forever. So if if we don't take advantage of it, if we're stupid enough not to plan for it and take advantage of it now, our grandchildren will, and it will ultimately have that connection. It just makes too much sense. And in San Diego Valley, they don't want to go downtown or go to LAX for these flights. They really want to go to Ontario. Uh, just out of, uh, out of curiosity, have you been involved with all the coordination with Sandbag on the airport extension from there and into the airport? You know, and, and you don't see a need, especially a need of the airport, to have some kind of uh, close coordination between the two agencies in terms of uh, mode, uh, you know, activities, so on and so forth. Yeah, I think Sandbag is really not. Uh, focused a lot on the Azusa to Montclair segment until it gets funded. They really don't want to jump in with both feet until they know it's funded. There's still a lot of work to be done uh, for Montclair to, to the airport uh, that really they have to do and they're not doing anything until that next segment gets funded. I think it's a mistake, but we, we've talked to them a lot yeah. and can't get them to bite they got to cough up about a million and a half dollars to do some, some study, get it started. So there's no interest in this answer? I don't, they're interested, they just haven't been willing to put any money up. I mean, because it's, it's uh, you know, I'm not trying to be silly with it, but they, they think it's a great idea, but they don't want to put any good money until they see that the, the phase before it is funded. That's the philosophy. Yes, Florida. So um, I do also ride the Gold Line twice every day, and I'm well aware of a lot of the development that's happening around stations below Pasadena, some of it very handsome. But I'm curious, I don't know that much about development that's happening from Pasadena out to Sierra Madre, although I do you know about Sierra Madre, but have there been other projects that have... Well, Del Mar, to Pasadena, 
So there's a lot going on in the West Pasadena area. We take credit for all of it, but a lot of it is just that it's transit, it's nearby transit, so developers are interested because of that it's nearby. So that's Del Mar. That's <coughs> it's, it's okay, so we take advantage of that. Uh, you know, then you go into the, the freeway stations, and I have my whole opinion about freeway stations, and elevated and not right there in the grassroots of the community. Uh, it's hard to develop around the freeway. Uh, when Metro handed us the plans for the Allen Station and for, for the Lake Station, they gave us no available land for parking or development. So there's no parking and no development in either of those. Now, the private sector is coming in. I know there was a power plant right there, and there was a lot going to happen at Lake, which I think the economy has, has slowed down or stopped. But ultimately, I, I don't see that being a problem. But there's nothing on the ground yet at Lake. Uh, Hill, Allen, you know, there's nothing in the East Pasadena development is, is pretty bad off. Always has been in East Pasadena, but we thought that the coal line would have done more. Nothing's happened there yet. So, to be honest with you, those two are probably the, only, the, um, the Allen one is the worst to develop because no one's coming to do anything. Lake, I think we'll get there because there's a lot of opportunities to Lake Street. But you think Monrovia and those? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because there's land. And before we got there, because they knew we were coming, they had confidence we were coming, the cities and the redevelopment agencies did things to secure land and create the general plan around transit. Yes, sir. Um, what I hear that you're free to put food in your mouth before I ask you. Sorry about that. <coughs> what do you know about the extension between Azusa and Montclair? I've heard conflicting reports. I work for Metro, I do armed security for them. I've talked to some of their personnel. They say they got plans in the work for extending it from Azusa to Montclair, but I've heard where conflict, conflicts on that where they say they don't have the funding for it. I've heard other conflicts where they say they got the bonds paid off so they can seek additional funding. What do you know about that? It's and what, uh, what are they going to call the new division that they're going to extend out to Monrovia? That's what I was going to ask. The, the maintenance facility? Uh, I don't know what they're going to call it. We call it the Gold Line Maintenance Campus. That's what we call it. But Metro will call it whatever they want. Okay. I'm not sure. Uh, we call it campus because it's right there in the community. We want to force the contractor to think more of it like a, a, a university campus, the way they treat the exterior and the way they're building around it, uh, and a little less like what you see at some of the other divisions, a little less industrial looking. So well, what about the extension from Azusa to Mark? And then the extension was environmentally cleared. Uh, and now we're going to be starting advanced conceptual engineering over the next couple of years. There's no funding to go beyond design and planning. So we're going to be looking for funding over the next couple of years. Do you think that, what, do you think that there's a possibility for it or do you think it's going to happen or what do you think is going to... I think if there's a, the next tax measure that goes before the voters is work in it, then the project will get funded. Yeah, will there be a discussion uh, with San Bernardino County to use the uh, old right-of-way that's going up through uh, Rancho Cucamonga? <coughs> well, they haven't made any plan uh, from, you mean from Montclair to Ontario Airport? Yeah, no, branching off of that. Yeah, no, Rancho is not very interested in having the line come to Rancho. Mm -hmm. they, are just, they have not been interested to this point. So I don't know what their plan is. There, there's a lot of study that needs to be done for that segment. People talk about it as if it's easy. It's a very difficult segment to build. You do not have the right of way. In our project, we own the right of way. Metro made that investment in the 80s, and it's paying off. Once you cross the county line, or after Montclair, actually, to the east, you do not have the right of way. So that's a big, big part of the, that phase of the project. And that's not our job, right? You know, I mean, we're not looking for more unf unfunded projects to build. We're trying to focus on what we're doing. And get San Bernardino excited about it and the airport authority excited about building it. So you've um, alluded to New Measure J a couple of times. And if you're in New Measure J, um, I'm wondering what your Measure J, as you know, was an extension of Measure R. Um, there was a provision that would have allowed for some flexibility in the future of shifted highway dollars and transit dollars under some circumstances. Um, how would you, or what's the Measure J framework that you're envisioning that might accomplish what you're, um, what you're hoping to see done here? 
Uh, I would go back to Measure R and the description of our project. And there's always been this disagreement about what, what the words say. Uh, but it's very clear to me that the project is defined LA to Claremont. <coughs> and you know they only put enough money in Measure R to get us to Azusa. They didn't give enough money to, to finish the whole thing as described in Measure R. So we would, we would request that that balance, which is about $950 million to get to the county line, be included in the new Measure J. Coming from when they allocated essentially all the money they projected, or is, oh, they had some contingency money that they that had been subsequently allocated on projects. But I mean, there was a fairly uh, sort of strictly defined uh, allocation of, of funding in Measure R. So if you're going to do that for the goal line to Montclair. You'd have to take money to somewhere else. Any ideas of where that comes from? It, it has to be expanded. I mean, it's that's clear. They Metro has, uh, you know, to get on my soapbox. <coughs> Metro has for for four years denied the what the measure says. Well, I, I, understand that. I, I, I understand the basis of that. I'm just trying to understand where the money comes from, though. That even if one defined it. You have to add the money into the column, right? You do. So some of the other projects that were not well defined in Measure R may have to be built later <coughs> or shortened. You know, there's uh, I don't have the words in front of me, but when you look at the way some of the other descriptions are, they're probably very loosely described, and then and now they're described much longer than they were actually described in the original Measure R. You know, some of the, <coughs> in the ocean, and now it's going to the ocean. You know, little things like this. Uh, which has expanded these projects and really expanded Metro's commitment to certain projects over others. We think that's not fair and it was not in Measure R, what we were, we were described. But yeah, it's a zero sum game to some extent. And that's why I think the expansion of Measure J or Measure R has to happen. And they're going to have to raise those dollars. Let's figure it out. Let's do it. Came so close last time. I mean, it was really a shame. I mean, unfortunately, we weren't in it, but I mean, the rest of the county, you know, $90 billion slipped through everybody's fingers. And maybe it was more inclusive. You know, maybe we all did a better job. It would have happened. <coughs> had a huge impact to the future of this county. I heard some of the money might be pulled from the 710 project because they're having such a difficult time with it, trying to push the freeway to South Pasadena, and because of the lawsuits that they may use that money to extend the goal line out to Montclair. Yeah, that's that's a possibility. Yeah. I I don't know. It's that's a tough one. It's tough to take money from projects and move them around. Uh, and there's a, a, a large advocacy group for the 710, uh, despite South Pasadena. So I, and Caltrans, for that matter, is you know, a huge advocate, obviously. So it's, it's tough to know what's going to happen. I don't think our future should be rest upon 710 not being built or money being taken away from one project or another. I think it should be built on, based on the merit. This is a good project could be built cost effectively and, and probably the next project that could actually go into construction ahead of some of the others because we so, are so well advanced compared to the other projects. Absolutely. The questions? Yes, sir. Just one question. Uh, when you said the difference between going to the ocean or going to the ocean, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. well, well, don't answer that. that. <laughs> 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 the change order. Yeah, it, it, the, the way Measure R was described, certain projects were described with the definition of beginning to an end, as ours was. Other projects were described in looser language, which didn't necessarily give you a terminus. And now they're being reinvented, and that's probably a little snarkier than I want to come off, but I mean, they're being redescribed a little longer than they were probably should have been described when our project was described, specifically described. Yeah, I just want to know how come it's so tough for Los Angeles to really get involved in uh, construction about these lines because San Diego, San Francisco, they all got service. And, and we're, you know, we're fighting tooth and nail because, you know, when they built that, they should have built that in one project right on up to the Montclair and they chopped it up and small segments like that. I mean, you know, it's, 
It's not that easy. It really isn't that easy. I, I think, you know, you know we, I grew up here, and I remember when they started talking about the subway, and I said, it's never going to happen. Yeah, and I, they started talking about Long Beach Line. I mean, you know, Gloria has been around writing about it for a few years, although she's only in junior high when all this was going on. But still, you know, she saw it, and you look at the map now, and it's, uh, it's a pretty great system that's been built uh, in a pretty short period of time. These projects, you all know, from the day a couple of people get together and talk about it being a good idea to the time you take the first ride, is 25 years. That's how long it takes. Well, you know, the county with the needs that we have and what's required to get a project to that stage to go into construction, uh, it's pretty complicated. And it's not a cop out, it's just that's how long it takes. Well, why have these other cities jumped on ahead of us? I think they've been at it too. I think they've been at it for decades as well. They've been at it for 20 years. Yeah. 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 They have less space for freeways. I can I can partially answer that. It's like I grew up in Pasadena, and when the Gold Line extension came through, there was some opposition to it. But for the most part, we because of the way it went through the right of way and the freeway, it didn't really disturb too many people. Everybody in South Pasadena, if anyone's from South Pasadena, sorry, they freaked out. Yeah. They had their they were picketing, they had their signs along everywhere. But after it went through and they wrote it, they all love it now. Yeah. I mean they love it. Yeah, well they we have it. the mayor of South Pasadena attending our events and being an advocate. And yeah. five years ago, you know, they were No, in they, court. they hated we're it. The I mean, they them. were all ready to sue and yeah. it's the worst thing ever, Armageddon, and now huh. they love it. So. And it's it's just yeah. it's the same people we deal with in Pasadena. But it's just, once you cross that city line, it's, it's just a different attitude towards yeah. the transit system. And that's why we're so fortunate with this segment of the project. There's such unanimous support for it. And you know, we, we feel that even despite you know, folks want a little this or a little that, can't you change this? For the most part, it's all minor. They all support the project. And they're all looking forward to it. Each of the cities from the mayors on down are all planning, and their agencies internally are planning for the project's expansion. So yeah. that's good news for Metro. It's good news for the system. Folks want to take it. They want bike lockers. They want better you know, transit access. They want bus routes rerouted. I mean, that's what we really want to be here. No one is screaming about building more parking. They want to get on, walk out of their door and get on a bus or you know, a shuttle and get to the station. That's really the thinking you want people to have. Yeah, well, it's because the, the 210, the way it's turning into, actually helps. Yeah. Because the 210 is turning into a mini 405 soon. Yeah. It's a parking lot. <laughs> yeah. Not so a freeway. It's much more convenient if the gold line ran, was done and we could take that. So that helps. <laughs> Okay, any more questions, Bart? Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. And I'm happy to come by. Uh, <laughs>
answer. I mean, everything is going to go. Our, our concept in 2003 was inland to the ocean. And 2016, we'll be able to go inland to the ocean. That's right. So those things are coming. And just keep at it. Thank you very much. Good job. PowerPoint will be available online if I either... I'm going to leave you the file. I'll take the disk and I'll be